Well, good morning or good afternoon and good evening, everyone, from when and where you may be watching. Uh, this is Eric Simpson once again from Rosenton Community Baptist Church. And thank you so much for joining in today as we're going to be continuing on in our study in Mark. If you want to grab your Bible to Mark chapter 9, going from verse 30 through verse 37. Um, it's good to see as I look around the village, uh, people out uh, walking about, doing a good job, uh, keeping distance and I really appreciate that as I walk down the pavement, walk down the sidewalk, that there, that I try to avoid people and give them space and people try to give me space and I really do appreciate that. Hopefully the time is coming not too far down the road when we won't have to do that and be so, be so cautious but to be able to you know, intermingle and, and talk to people and not being uh, so afraid of this whole COVID thing. Um, it's good to see also my uh, mother and father-in-law are in southern Texas, um, uh, away from their home in Missouri for two, three months. And uh, they had a really cold uh, period of weather that had come through, very unusual. Uh, killed off, unfortunately, a lot of the plants and so forth. But it looks like the temperatures are back up and they're back to more seasonal weather. And that is good. Today, we want to come to this portion of scripture. And we're going to entitle this, The Danger of Racing for the Pole Position. And you may say, Eric, what, what are you on about? Is actually, the Bible is actually talk about uh, racing and car racing and so forth? Uh, no. No, not as such. But, you know, this whole world of, of auto racing, uh, the rules vary from, uh, from, from, from race to race or maybe from uh, style of, of racing to another. I will readily admit I am not a massive fan of auto racing other than, say, uh, the drag races, which is a quarter mile of getting a car as fast as you can down that, down that uh, quarter mile stretch. An incredible, incredible type of racing that is. But I do know enough... <clears throat> that in any particular car race, say other than that particular kind of car race, what's called the pole position is incredibly important. That is the one who starts from the front of the pack, the most desirable starting point in any race is well sought after. Uh, from what I understand, the very, there are various ways to decide who gets the pole position, what car, what driver. Uh, I was always under the presumption that it was always qualifying uh, laps before the race to find out who has that honor of being in that pole position. Uh, not always the case, apparently, if I, what I read is correct. Uh, sometimes there's uh, standings that will determine that. And even sometimes, uh, if this is true, that race promoters will actually maybe do the heats, come up with the fastest cars, and then turn everything on its tail and put the faster cars in the back, slower cars in the front, to give the spectators a bit more of a show of cars passing and so forth. Now that's up to, for you to debate on whether that is good or not good. However, however, that is fine for auto racing, but sadly, in the world of Christians, and church leaders and churches and Christian organizations, we can be guilty of racing and vying for the pole position. On which church is the biggest? Which church is the quote unquote best? Which church has the better youth program or children's program or young adult program or best preacher who stands behind the pulpit on a Sunday and whatever best means and how that is defined because certainly we're going to find out not just one time but more than one time that these disciples were guilty of vying for the pole position so Eric is that a good thing no it's not a good thing it's not a good thing and I would say that I've been guilty of that myself. Not so much in an outward way of expressing jealousy or I wish that kind of thing. It more shows itself when you get ministers together and they start to talk and almost invariably 
the question will come up or the subject will come up of, so how many do you have on a Sunday morning? Or with youth leaders, so how many do you have that come to your Friday youth group or whatever day of the week it is? Now, I realize it doesn't have to be necessarily vying for that pole position. Well, what that does do is that that often lends itself to, well, blimey, he's got 100 in his church, or from the state's perspective, maybe 500, and I've only got 100. And when you use that word only in there, thinking that if I have 100 in our church versus 500 down the road, that God is less pleased with what is going on here. I was in a Zoom chat with a, 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 few, a, a number of other sort of messy church um, leaders. And uh, it was just sort of a get together and try to encourage each other and so forth. And, and, and it came up with numbers. And I've been, and I've been incredibly blessed and, and, and chuffed, happy that we've been able to be able to do the messy church in a bag and it's gone over well here in the village. And I really appreciate that and all the help that goes in, into that and the people who are expressing the desire to have those bags and so forth. That's really good. And this came up in a conversation. And one of the ladies said, well, oh, Erica, yeah, that's really great about you all having, we, and the word she said, well, we only have, and whatever the number was. And I thought to myself, you know what? That is not that that is not the way this this works. That is not the way this works, because they may have the only whatever numbers we may have this number, but that is the point. The point is that they're doing their job in their village or their place to the best of their ability and all the gifting that God has given to them, and we're doing what we're doing in maybe a different way. And yes, the numbers are different, but my number is going to be less than somebody else's number. And then we can compare all the numbers and all the statistics, but at the end of the day, the real question is, are we doing what God has called us to do in the place that God has called us to do it? And we have to be incredibly careful about this whole idea of racing for the pole position. So we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37, dividing this up into two sections. The first section being, the first point being of the disciples battling the same battles, verses 30 through 34. And then the second point being a lesson from a child in verses 35 through 37. Let's pray, and we're going to dive right into the scriptures. Father, thank you so much for your word that you teach us so much. And I pray that you'd help us right now to be teachable. Father, maybe there are some believers out there right now who are feeling inferior for whatever reason. Um, maybe they're feeling unduly superior for whatever reason. Father, I pray that you would both challenge and teach us and encourage us according to what we need. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Father, for all, uh, all that you do to, to teach us, to challenge us. And Lord, thank you that your word is so real, that it doesn't sit, sit up on the airy fairy shelf and talk about things that mean nothing to us, but this comes right down to where we live. And Father, we ask that you would help me to be a blessing and a challenge. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to be reading Mark chapter 9, excuse me, Mark chapter 9, verse 30 through 34. If you want to grab a Bible, please do. We'll be putting the verses up on the video as we always do. Here we go. The Bible says this. Then they departed from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know it. Remember last week we looked at that Jesus was had healed the young lad from being having that uh, that demon uh, possessing him. Quite a dramatic, quite an intense situation. This is where the father cried out, uh, "Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief." Do you remember all that? Verse thirty-one. Now, for he taught his disciples and said to them, "Does this sound familiar? By the way, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men." And they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. 
And he did not, they did not understand this saying and were afraid to ask him. Then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What was it you disputed amongst yourselves on the road? But they kept quiet, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. These disciples battled the same battles. We've seen this before, haven't we? We've seen now this is the second time that Jesus comes out with a statement of the Son of Man is going to be taken. Now, the words are slightly different. We're going to point out something that hopefully will be a challenge to us. But the large picture is that Jesus is saying, I'm going to be taken, I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to rise again on the third day. The second time Jesus says this in, in a relatively short period of time. Jesus predicts, he repeats his future death and resurrection. But notice what the Bible says, that the Bible says that they did not understand this saying and they were afraid to ask him. What is it that they do not understand? Is it that they did not believe him? I wonder if it that they did not believe him. The Bible says that they are afraid to ask him. And if you remember the last time when Peter pulled him aside and said, Oh, Jesus, now what, what are you talking about here? What are you, what, what are you talking about this thing about you know, the death and the resurrection? Why, uh, why that's not going to happen. Then remember Jesus turned to him and basically said, Don't let Satan use you as a mouthpiece, Peter. And I think by this time, these disciples were afraid to ask him, thinking maybe Jesus will turn around and say something like that to them. So what do you think the struggle is for them to believe what Jesus is saying? I mean, it's not that he's keeping this thing in a box. He has said it uh, really more than once to them. They're struggling with believing. They're struggling with trying to get their head around who this really is. But I have to keep coming back to the facts of what all they have seen. They've seen Jesus raise the dead. They've seen Jesus heal numerous people. They've just seen a dramatic exorcism, a demon that was cast out of a lad. They've seen Jesus create food. Couldn't they put all that together and say, wow, this is truly a unique person. This is someone that can be truly believed for anything that he says. Are they struggling to believe Jesus? Are they struggling to believe the facts? I don't know. But the facts speak for themselves, don't they? I think possibly it could be that they're struggling to refuse to take it on board. This thing of Jesus being put to death. And still I maintain that they're struggling with the idea of him rising again. I think what they're focusing on this idea is of Jesus being put, in, put to death, in essence, taken from them. Because Jesus' death doesn't fit into their preconceived idea of what would happen. Jesus shows up on the scene. He calls all these 12 in the various ways that they've been called. And they now have been following him, watching all what he has done. And they would be thinking, oh, what a, an incredible thing this is. Why, this is going to last forever and a day, and I just can't believe what kind of incredible, incredible thing that we're involved with, all what Jesus is doing. And this is going to be wonderful. You know, we do the same thing. We really do the same thing. Maybe we come into a Christian life or maybe we've been, we had grown up in, in a Christian family, maybe a few of us, maybe some of us. And then we have this idea on what the Christian life is going to be all about. That we grow up thinking, 
well, I'm going to go to school, I'm going to learn a trade, or I'm going to go to uni, I'm going to be a professional, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to find this, I'm going to find this perfect Christian partner, and we're going to have two or three perfect Christian children, and we're going to live in this perfect Christian house, attend this perfect Christian uh, church, and be involved in this perfect Christian ministry, and then uh, we're going to have these perfect Christian grandchildren after my, after my perfect Christian children uh, marry other perfect Christians. And then we're going to watch those perfect, uh, perfect uh, uh, Christian grandchildren grow up. And one of these days that when, when our time is up, uh, that uh, God is going to call us home, uh, we, we will die in an incredibly peaceful, wonderful way. And uh, we're going to meet uh, Jesus at the gates of glory, having left all these per perfect Christian things here on earth until we see each other yet again. We don't plan for cancer. We don't plan for financial disaster. We don't plan for our children uh, turning from the faith. We don't, turn, we, we, we don't plan for losing uh, the job that meant so much to us. We don't plan for our church splitting or having problems. We don't plan for that. And so I think this thing of believing God and trusting God Although they, too, they should be two sides of the same coin, I think we're, we can say that we believe something, but do we really trust it? Do we really take it on board? Do we really say that Jesus is not just my Savior, but He is my Lord in every part of my life, and I trust Him for everything in my life? That if Jesus was, if Jesus was alive and standing by me today, that if he was to say, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to be taken by the hands of men, and I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be killed, and three days later I'm going to rise again, would I say, wow, I had this great vision of what it was going to be like, but that doesn't fit in my vision, so I don't want to take it on board. I'm going to struggle with it. Or do we say, you know what? I've seen all what Jesus can do, and I've seen the scriptures, all what Jesus can do, and I know who Jesus is. And you know what? Whatever he's got out there for me, I'm going to say that he loves me, he's got a plan, and my job, as we mentioned before, my job is to trust that my Heavenly Father has my best interest at his heart. And that doesn't mean that the circumstances of my life are always going to be nice and warm and peaches and cream but that he is going to walk with me. And I've taken hold on this little, little sign that we've got up on our wall. It says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, through the valley of the shadow of death, it's not that I walk alone, but I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And if there's a key to the Christian life, I would say that is it. And I think this is one of the things that the, these disciples struggled with understanding. And because they struggled with understanding and taking it on board, they really battled with this idea of losing Jesus in the way that in their mind that they heard Jesus say. But then we see in verses 33, as Jesus asked them, and isn't it amazing how that Jesus knew what they were debating, knew what they were talking about, but he's the master of asking questions. So he would say, so you lot, what were you discussing? What were you talking about amongst yourselves on the road? Verse 34. But they kept quiet. On, uh, but they kept quiet, but they kept silent. For on the road they had disputed amongst themselves who would be the greatest. They were vying for pole position as they were walking on the road with Jesus. They were debating who would be the greatest. You know what? It's going to happen again, this question. Not too long down the road, in Mark chapter 10, uh, verse 35 and onward, just another chapter down the road, after Jesus deals with this, and this is what blows my mind, we're going to come to this again, that the brothers, James and John, once again, will come to Jesus and say, Jesus, 
you know, who's going to be able to, can, can, can we ask you something? Can you do something for us? Then one may sit on the right and one may sit on the left hand with you in glory. The other disciples got angry when they heard James and John asking Jesus about that. What were they doing? They were vying for the pole position. They were trying to see who was the greatest. What an incredible thing. Now, let's take quick, just take a quick moment now. And I find this incredibly fascinating. You know, this thing of when Jesus talks about what's going to happen with him, He's going to be taken and killed and rise again the third day. Do you remember the last time we saw this? There is a slight bit of difference between this instance and the previous one. Let's take a brief look at that. In chapter 8, just a page or so back, chapter 8, verses 31 through 33, let me read that one to you. It says this, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. Sounds similar, doesn't it? Let's read our current portion. Chapter 9, verse 31. And he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is being betrayed. The previous one said he's going to be uh, taken by the scribes and the Pharisees and, 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 and so forth and so on. But this time he says the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. The hands of men would be the scribes and so forth that Jesus was talking about. But now Jesus adds an element of something that's going to be happening down the road not too far. He said that the Son of Man is going to be betrayed. And what's the point there? The point is that Jesus is taking the focus off of others, off of the scribes and the Pharisees and those who are, who are, who are, uh, who are gunning for him right now, and he turns it inward because betrayal comes from within the inner circle. And that's exactly what is going to happen? And I believe this is the first time that this concept is going to come out. Now, let's put a little bit of a time scale on this particular, con this, this idea. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 25, let me just quickly read that to you. Matthew chapter 26, 26 verse 25. Um, Jesus is now celebrating the Passover with his disciples there in the upper room. Let me read this to you of an account of what happens. Uh, Jesus is, is speaking, it says this in verse 24. Let's back up to verse 24. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been uh, good for that man if he had not been born. Verse 25, then Judas, who we know is the betrayer, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, you have said it. Judas said, surely it is not me. But hold on now, hold on now. Judas is no innocent party to this. Because in Mark chapter 14, verse 10, Judas had gone to make arrangements and plans with the Pharisees to betray Jesus. He had already done that before coming to that time in the upper room when Jesus mentions about a betrayer. And Judas says, oh, is it not me, is it? How prideful can it be? How prideful can it be? Judas, who knowingly and with forethought betrayed Jesus and then had the audacity, audacity to sit around that table with Jesus and the others and say, what? Someone's going to betray. Is it, is it me? Well, Judas, of course it's you. You're the one who's going to sell Jesus for that handful of coins. 
And this whole thing of religious pride. And I'm not sure what was on Judas's mind. Maybe he didn't want to look bad in front of the others. And how incredibly prideful is that? He didn't want to look like he was uh, uh, doing anything along those lines in front of the others that he had been walking with for those three years. And what a terror. It would have been much better for Judas to stick his hand up and say, yep, I'm the one. Of course they would have been upset with him, but at least he would have been honest. But instead, the betrayer that he was, being prideful, religiously prideful, can I add, says those words. And this thing of religious pride has all kinds of problems associated with it. Two came to my mind straight away. When it comes to us, we have to be incredibly careful. This thing of being prideful, vying for the pole position, thinking that, well, we've got to have the best this or the best the other, or the best service, or the best music, or the, uh, we should try to do all that we can, absolutely. We want to do everything, uh, you know, to, 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 to honor God, to, 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 have a, to have a high standard that when people come in, they will, they will sense that there is a sense of purpose and, and planning and, and, and honor put into all this. But is the whole point to put on a show, or is the whole point to honor God? And that's where the line is divided. Here's a couple problems, very briefly, this thing of religious pride. First of all, that all the results are, are all the results and things that happen are a result of my effort. And this is a problem with religious pride. Pride in anything that's Christian related. Why, why we've got a big, why, why we've got a successful, messy church. Why, look at what a good job Eric has done. No, no. Because here's what I found out to be true. You know, when I can put the same amount of effort into any particular thing, any particular activity, but when I have, when I've noticed, when I've noticed within myself that it's all because it's all for accolades for Eric or something along those lines, I find out that, that does, it's not near as successful as something else that I didn't have that attitude about. Or sometimes there could be this, even, even amongst the world of, of ministers of what a successful sermon is of how many views it has in today's world, or how many likes it has in today's world. No, that's not, the, that's not the measure of a successful sermon. The measure of a successful sermon is that does God use it to touch and change and challenge lives? And that may, that may, that may not get any likes. That may not get any people saying, what a good sermon, what a great job that is. That may be about getting people upset to the point of, them being willing to get down on their knees and ask God for forgiveness and ask God to change them. Number two, the second problem with religious pride is this, that my value and my purpose comes from my role rather than my value and my purpose comes from knowing my God, that I'm created in God's image, that he does have a purpose and plan for my life. And even though I may not have the pole position, that if I am doing what God has called me to do, where God has called me to do it, and if I'm nothing, no more than, than, than in a little corner of the world doing that, then I'm as successful as anyone else who may be much more in the limelight doing the big, big work as people see the big, big work. That is the problem we have to be incredibly careful about. And then when you want to come to this second section now, verses 35 through 37, we're going to just call this a lesson from a child. Jesus has now set them up. He, is, he had asked them the question uh, about what were you discussing? They kept silent because they disputed amongst themselves who would be the greatest. They 
did not respond. As the scripture says, they kept silent. But Jesus, being Jesus, Jesus being God, knew what was on their heart, knew what was going on. He wanted them to confess what was going on, to tell him what was going on. They didn't. But he said, okay, we need a lesson anyway. So verse 35 through 37 says this. And he sat down, called the twelve. He said, come on over here, lads. We need to talk. And he said to them, if anyone desires to be first, ooh, <laughs> bet that hurt. If anyone desires the pole position, he shall be last of all and servant of all. They weren't ready for that. And he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to him, he picked up his little child and said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Jesus said, listen, if you want to be great, if you want to be great, here's a formula for greatness. He said, you need to first of all desire to be last. Because here's the issue. If you desire to be first, the, there's nothing wrong with being first, by the way. Nothing wrong with being first. You may say, if you know your Bible, you say, well, Eric, the Bible says that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Okay, yeah, okay. And it goes along with sort of what we're saying here. But Jesus said, in essence, he said, the problem is the desire to be first. Somebody is going to be first. There will be a church that has the biggest sun Sunday congregation. There will be a youth group that has the biggest number of, uh, of youth attending. There will be a messy church that has the biggest messy church. That's not the point. The point is not that, that, that there's not going to be a first and a second and third as far as numbers and so forth and so on. That's not the issue. The issue is the desiring of it. And when, the, the, when, the, when that desire is there, that's when the pride wells up. That's when the problem comes in of your identification and your value of, of what it's all about rather than focusing on what God wants you to focus on, on what God wants me to focus on, is that doing His work in His place in the area that God has called us to be. He said, listen, there's two things. First of all, the desire to be last. He said, if you want to be great, there's two things. You shall be last of all, and secondly, the servant of all. The servant of all. And then he had an incredibly powerful illustration that he's going to give. The Bible says that he takes a child. We don't know where this child came from. They went into a house. We don't know particularly what house it was. But we took a Jesus took this child and set him amongst them in his arms, the Bible says. He took him in his arms. And he took this child and he says, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. Now, in the Greek language, this whole thing about the child... In the Greek language, there's various words like we have for children of all ages and, 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 and sizes and so forth. You know, for example, a baby is different than an infant, right? An infant maybe is different than a toddler, slightly. Which is maybe has a different idea than a child. Which is a different idea maybe even than a boy. A boy, a boy could be more of a broad type of word which is different than a teenager, which we all know. However, this particular word here refers to a young child, possibly in the range of a toddler to maybe a five-year-old, something along the line. So what, it wouldn't have been a, 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 a teeny baby. It wouldn't have been a teenager or a preteen. It would have been that younger age group. Jesus said, whoever receives one of these, notice the progression. He says, receives me, but doesn't receive me, receives the Father. Jesus is doing what? He is putting incredible value on 
that child and the perspective of that child. Eric, what's the point of that? Here's the point. That within that culture of 2,000 plus years ago, children quite often were not even considered fully human or valuable. They were there to do the menial work and for the boys to learn a trade, for the girls often to help their mother in the house, but to be considered, certainly at that age, highly valuable and fully human was not a common thing. You may say, Eric, how awful is that? Now, wait a minute. It hasn't been that long since we've been there. Isn't it true? Isn't it true? I, uh, just a few years ago, went down to Bristol and visited the, 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 the place that is now a designated sort of house stroke, ministry stroke museum for George Mueller. If you ever get a chance to do that, do it. It is absolutely phenomenal. George Mueller, who died in 1898, 1898. So he's only been dead for roughly 130 years. George Mueller... Uh, during, the, the, during his earlier years, so this would have been the mid-19th century, the 1850s, uh, the 1860s, he looked around at the streets of Bristol and the streets where, where, where he went and preached and ministered and saw homeless children. He saw children who were, uh, and families who were, had, to, had no other means because they were so poor they had to go to the workhouses. And doing a little bit of research on the workhouses of, in, in England back at that time, uh, a lot of the opinions of what had happened there, they're in essence no more than higher level prisons. That these, these families were, were, were broken apart, they were, they were split up, children forced to work in highly uh, filthy, uh, incredibly uh, laborious types of labor for 10 or 12 hours in a day. And the only thing they did was either work or they slept. And the conditions that they had to live was absolutely horrendous. And George Mueller saw that. He said, this is not right. So George Mueller then, over the, over the years that he built his orphanages, housed just over 10,000 orphans. 10,000 orphans. You may have seen the film or the play by Charles Dickens, Oliver Twist. And the iconic classic line, where as those, all those, whether they're all boys or those children, were in that dinner hall, in that dirty place, sitting at those tables, with that pan of gruel sitting in front of them, Oliver gets up and goes to, goes to the person in charge with his tin in his hand and said, please, sir, I want some more. Which, come to find out, was not allowed. Not just in the film, but that was real life. It was not allowed. And when all those children turned around and saw Oliver do that, they were shocked. They couldn't believe that one would ask for any more food. So when Jesus takes this child and essentially says, essentially applies incredible value to this child, he said, he said, when you receive this child, you receive me and you receive the Father. And Jesus thinks much about the children. He said, unless you become as this child, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. I started to think, and we're going to just close out with this. I want us just to consider some characteristics of a child. On the whole, now I realize that children are the personalities of their, cell, of their, of their own, and, and we have three, and they each have three unique personalities, but certainly, certainly, of children of that age, you know, the per, there, are, the, there are personalities there, but there are some common commonalities that let's just bring out and just think just for a moment as we challenge ourselves about this thing of pride, this thing of vying for the pole position, and this thing of receiving this child and 
seeing what Jesus says is important, and can we take on the characteristics of this child into our own lives? Number one, that children do not see status. Rather, they see a person. You know what I love to see, and, and, and when I walk around in, in the involvement of the schools, and particularly the infant schools, and this would be sort of the age of the child, almost assuredly, that Jesus had picked up and used as an illustration. You know, these, these, these children, you know, they, don't, they don't see and ask the question, oh, what color skin do you have? And that will determine whether I can play with you or not. They don't do that. They, they, they don't look at, at, at whether their uniform is a bit scruffy or it's, uh, it, 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 it's pristine clean. They, they, they don't do that. They don't even look at, they don't even look at whether these children have glasses or not, or whether this, ch this child is disabled or not. But they see a person rather than status in a situation. I wonder, I wonder, how much of a child do we emulate in that situation? Number two, children are quick to, quick to believe rather than doubt. <laughs> You may say, Eric, you, you mean I'm supposed to believe anything that anyone says? No, no. The, and the Bible says that we need to check things out. Uh, you know, we have, to, we have to be wise. We have to be discerning and all those sort of things, of course. But you know what? Jesus rebuked these disciples. He got upset with them last week, if you remember. He said, how much, how, how, how much longer am I going to have to bear with you? How much longer am I going to have to suffer with you? And if we have come to faith in Christ, that we have received Jesus as our Savior, that, you say, that we say we belong to God, I am a follower of Jesus Christ, am I quick to believe and trust? Or do, is doubt my major theme? Because children are fantastic. I mean, they just... I mean, when we're sat there in assembly, and hopefully we'll be able to get back to assembly at some point, I mean, they just drink in the stories. They just drink in the, the truth about who Jesus is, and the truth about who God is, and wow, they're absolutely amazed. Number three, children are quick to support rather than tear down. Children are quick to support rather than tear down. I just loved watching a Special Olympics video, and I remember seeing this some years ago. It was a it was a 50 meter race or some short race like that and and uh, eight or ten uh, uh, mostly Downs uh, Downs children lined up and they were probably eight or ten years old seven eight nine ten years old they lined up and that gun went off and they took off running down that track as fast as they could and one of those about the third one in stumbled and I don't can't remember what he stumbled on or saw what he stumbled but he stumbled and he laid on that track. And the amazing thing was, is that when those other runners saw what had happened, they stopped. And they turned around. And they gathered around that child and they lifted him up. Put him back on his feet. And in the video that I saw just recently, that they linked their arms and then ran down to the finish line together. There is no vying for the pole position there. There is no trying to see who is the greatest one there. And I like races. I'm not against races. I like running races and all that goes along with them. But that little, uh, that little 60 second event, that little two minute event showed what's important. That's important to support rather than tear down. I wonder, would we be willing to do that? Would we be willing to not come in first place for the support of somebody else? Would we be willing to do that? And number four, and I'm done. That children don't care who's in first. Rather, they're more about hanging out, chatting with others, and even giving them a kiss. Eric, what are you on about? In my... Uh, checking out that Special Olympics video, I came across something else. I wasn't, I wasn't planning on this. 
And it was a, it was a baby race, a baby race. So in, uh, in a basketball court, I presume it was during halftime, they had set out a line of parents, one on one side, uh, about 20 meters down, uh, the other pen on the other side, and they set these little babies, a, a, a year, 15, 16 months, whatever it is, at the point where they're confidently crawling. And they won uh, 250 quid, 250 dollars, whatever it would be, you know, some prize for whatever baby would get across uh, from this side to this side. And it was an absolute hoot watching them. And I thought, what an incredible lesson that is. And these babies, as they sort of, you know, so the, the gun went off, boom, they weren't terribly bothered. And then one or two sort of got off and they were just kind of going like that down, uh, down to get, get, get to, to mom or dad. Whoever's, and this one started taking, go, go, going down there and almost got to the end. And he turned around. And he saw someone else and said, whoo, I'd like to go say hi. So we toddle off, oh, uh, it kind of crawled back to where the other one was. And, and it happened to be a little girl. And uh, he, just saw, he, just, he just kind of pulled himself up and sat there. And she just sat there. And then he reached her up to give her a hug. And gave her a little peck on the cheek. And all the parents were laughing and going crazy and they couldn't believe it. And uh, he wasn't bothered about women. Couldn't care less. He was bothered about who was in the race. He was interested in chatting and, and, and uh, seeing what was happening. And then he sort of Kind of took off back and then he kind of went back and then the little, the little girl sort of headed, headed down toward her parents and just kind of stopped and looked around and see what was going on. And eventually she did cross over to the finish line. Yeah, she won. But I tell you what, the whole process of that race taught me a lot. It's not about being in the pole position. It's not about winning. It's not about being first. It's not about crossing that line and saying, I'm number one, but the whole process of interacting, the whole process of being was far more important than being the, one, the first one across the line. And I pray that for everyone who's listening to me, if you are a Christian, that you will understand that your Christian race it's not about who comes across first. As Paul said, that he looked back at the end of his life, he said, I've finished my race. I've done the best I can. And us finishing our race, running our race that God has called us to do, that is where it's at. So let's be incredibly careful about this thing of religious pride, Let's be incredibly careful about this thing of vying for the pole position. And let's remember those little children that are out there that God has given to us to teach us, to challenge us, that we could be all what God has called us to be. Thank you so much for watching. and I pray God's blessing on you, and we'll see you next time.